Psi Access, May 11, 2024. The Textured Universe, 3D Printing Technology and Materials to Stimulate Interest in Science. Dr. Carol Christian. Okay, as Anna said, I'm Dr. Carol Christian. I am a Caucasian woman with blonde, short blonde hair and uh, pron pronounced she, her, and um, Space Telescope Science Institute is the institute um, where we have a contract to run the Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb. We will run the Roman Telescope, and we hope to have a role in habitable worlds in the future. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about today is that we had a program that we started way back in about 2014. So we've been at this for quite a while. And I'm going to speak to you about how we created some of the astronomical 3D prints for use in STEM astronomy education and outreach. Our target audience in particular were individuals with blindness and visual impairment, but anybody can use these materials. So why do we care about about astronomy well as a stem science and uh, people have have discussed this already so i'm preaching to the choir here but it's really exciting for people people are fascinated by astronomy i mean people are looking at the aurora they want the eclipse they want to know everything about the universe so that excitement is there we want to capitalize on that to increase their interest and possibly career paths in stem um, it does demand imagination, training, skill, and of course, a lot of interest. And knowledge about the universe comes from studying light and simulations, as we know. But the data representations that has been pointed out very early in this conference is mostly visual. We take almost every kind of data in astronomy and translate it into the visual so that we can um, share it among our scientific colleagues, but also with the public. Well, that presents a problem for anyone that has any kind of visual impairment. So in the slide, uh, I reiterate those points, but also at the bottom of the slide, near the bottom of the slides, I have a little graphic that demonstrates the way that astronomers get data is we get it through specific instrumentation, either imagery, spectroscopy, um, acoustics, gravitational waves, whatever. And that data is taken and translated. Here uh, in my slide, I'm showing three essentially processed, but single filter. So that using the Hubble Space Telescope, putting one filter in front of the detector for a specific purpose of either measuring temperature or some chemistry. And then each one of those images is then assigned a color. Usually what we do at Hubble is to put it in order of wavelength. So the highest energy um, detected would be, or filtered would be blue and then, sorry, I did it in the reverse order. Um, the highest energy would be, be blue, that's true. Then um, green and then red for the longer wavelengths. And now with James Webb, we have a new color sequence um, in the infrared. And in the end, what we get usually is some kind of a beautiful press release image. This, the slide I'm showing now is showing that how do we get that information out to the public? Well, through the process of press releases, which is kind of a single source for the media, I'm showing a graphic that um, is supposed to illustrate a science team looking at their data, writing a paper, but also working with the news team, uh, in particular news team that I'm on, to get the results out, create a press release and push it out to the media, which is our primary audience, but of course, all the material is available to anybody on the public through the website. This is NASA, open to all, data free. Um, anybody can have these images. We also have channels to push that information, the background information, all the details of the observations, why the scientists are doing the science out into a number of channels, formal education channels, informal science, and general outreach. The other interesting thing with Hubble is though, so this is our 34th year. We just spent, uh, celebrated our 34th anniversary that Hubble itself has worked its way into the culture. We have fashion. We have pictures of Hubble on the side of U-Hauls. We had Pearl Jam put it on the front of their album. 
There are people who've made quilts, paintings, recordings, poetry, music, tattoos, and beautiful exhibitry based on Hubble because it's so inspiring. We want to share that. We need to share that with everyone and have everyone take part of that. So my next slide is a bit wordy. Um, there is a small graphic in the in the or picture in the corner which shows a 3D printer. Um, because we know and we wanted to focus in 2014, I and my collaborators, and I have quite a number of them, um, Anna being one of them, I will say, uh, where we wanted to try to take the press release pictures in particular and move them into a format that would be accessible. We did have a project that used iPad and a gridding pattern on the front. You could move your finger around. It would describe to you what the image was about. We decided in this project that we were going to try 3D printing. Now, this is the early days. Everybody's doing 3D printing now, but this is very early days of 3D printing. And not many people had done scientific data transformed to 3D prints. So that was a challenge in itself that we won't even go down that path right now. But the, the idea was to make the science more approachable and to see if 3D prints could actually convey some of the information. It's an imperfect translation, but it, it could try to translate some of the astrophysical phenomena that we were seeing in our studies. So... The project uh, was to use a 3D printing, and so we had to figure out how to do this. Not many people had done it before. I think there were some biology and maybe chemistry. We also partnered with a, a, a few people locally at a local university that had done some things with graphing, but we wanted to cha change imagery. Now, there's a simple way, to, sort of a simple way to do that is to process the image and just use the intensity, and then you can feel the intensity. Um, and that's useful, but we wanted to do something with a little higher fidelity. And the purpose, again, I'm just going to pound this one, is that we wanted to stimulate interest and confidence and skill in STEM for individuals with BBI. So we have many materials, but I'm focusing here only on the 3D printer. In the imagery that I'm showing on this slide are a 3D printer in the process of making a print, um, also, uh, the software where we bring the print file in, we adjust parameters and ready it for printing. And then the final product, I have a picture of someone examining one of our astronomical objects. So we wanted to figure out, A, make a process that makes these prints. We wanted to put textures instead of color, textures, so that you could feel where the colors were in the press release images that delineated specific features in the object so that we could understand what kind of astrophysics was going on. So we needed to provide software, we had to test materials, and then we had to do a study to see that we had high fidelity and integrity in the materials. We didn't want to just produce something and throw it out there and hope it worked. So we actually spent a number of years, and Anna can test to back me up on this, of testing, trying different things, making new prints, taking it to various places to have people test the prints. Eventually, we wanted to build a cohort of educators who could use these products, and you're going to hear about that later in this strand um, at the next talk with my collaborator, Tom Madura. So how do we represent the astronomical data? Well, we thought we would start with a study that we were involved in. And one of my colleagues, Antonella Nota, um, and her cadre of people had been studying a star cluster. Now I'm a star cluster person. These are collections of stars that form together out of gas and dust. And they, when they're first born, they emerge from this material. And so the, the, the image of such an object is quite rich with lots of stuff going on. Stars, gas, dust, filaments, bow shocks. So NGC 602, uh, which I show in some imagery here, um, was uh, observed by Hubble Space Telescope. And the scientists who had studied it had figured out the depth, and you can't see it from the picture, but you have, by doing detailed studies, you can tell the depth of the image and how deep the, the, the cluster is, where the stars are, and where the gas and dust is. So we delineated all of 
that. And the images shown on this slide show that. First, there's a, the image itself. There's some delineation um, drawn in of where the gas and dust and what we call filamentary structure, which is kind of dark, dusty stuff, um, and also where the, st the stars were. And then we decided to assign specific textures to those features so that when you touch the 3D print, you could tell where the gas was, where the stars were, etc. Okay, so that's step one. We figured out we want to do this. Now what? Fortunately, people had uh, done some work before, and I want to quote my collaborator, Noreen Grice, but also David Hurd, who had done a lot of work on translating ast astronomical data into Braille. So using swell form, um, they had uh, created constellation maps. There's some NASA resources. There's even eclipse uh, resources that are, that are Braille. Um, and so Braille was kind of a guiding light. And Noreen had a lot of knowledge about how you make uh, an object so that it, it's no wider than at least two hand spans, um, what kind of textures would work. And so we had made, and what I'm showing in this slide is a photograph of one of the texture keys that we used for NGC 602, where we took the translated um, parameters of the cluster onto this braille form. Um, and so different textures are shown. There are lines, there are crosshatch lines at a slant, there are some little pyramid-like things, and then a bunch of dots which represent the stars. So each one of those features represents something in the cluster itself. Um, so we tried that, we tried other grids, and then we decided, okay, boldly go, let's print it. So we needed some software to create the, the prints. And so I enlisted uh, several software engineers who tried their hand at doing this, of translating the textures into a format which is compatible with a 3D printer. It's called an STL file, stereolithography file, and that you uh, download to a printer and then it will print it. So what I'm showing in this slide is that we had made many textures. There's only a few samples. Um, we have a sample card. It's kind of like if you want to go pick out tile or uh, paint or carpet, where you have little samples and you decide what you'd like. So what we did is in the, in the one image, I show the actual sample sheet. It's a 3D printed plastic um, a rectangle that has little tiny squares in it that are all different textures. And then below I'm showing um, a description of what those are and what people thought about them. So we went around to a number of people, said, feel this thing, what do you like? What can you feel? Please close your eyes when you do it. Also, you can look at it, see what you visually think, etc. And then in the bottom, I just have a little, it's very hard to see, but it's, it was a disc, a, 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 a sphere that we had put some of the textures on to see how they would go not only on a flat surface, but on a spherical surface. So we ended up with stipple, with something I call stipple, which are spaced dots. They're sort of, they're between a dot and a triangle. And so they could be linear, hexagonal patterns, diamond patterns. We had to vary the diameter, the height, and the spacing for creating roughness or smoothness. We also had lines which were vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. Again, thickness, height, and spacing. And then we had a number of cylinders that we were going to use for the star symbol. So we tested all this, took them to uh, National Federation of the Blind, uh, community meetings, all kinds of things. What do you think of these textures? And we got a lot of feedback. So once we got those textures, we then went back to the, the Braille representation of NGC 602, looked at what the science team had designated as the different features, and assigned those textures to those features. In this particular slide, I am showing two different product, well, three products. One, which is shown on the right, and it happens to be bl in blue, we printed it in blue, are the th three textures the soft stipple, lines, rough stipple, and cylinders. And those represent gas, filament, dust, and stars, the components in the star cluster. 
The first thing we made is exactly analogous to the Braille in that we did a flat texture map. It's just flat, has no intensity information. It just shows like a flat image where the, the features of the star cluster are. Secondly, then we added the intensity detected by Hubble in those areas. And that creates a relief map, but it has the textures on top of it. And that is the unique thing we did in this study is to assign textures to the intensity, not just make a relief map. So we called those texture maps and elevation maps. Then testing. We tested, tested, tested. We went to conferences, events, youth slam, grab people off the street, here, try these. And so they tried the Braille, they tried the texture map, and they tried the relief maps, the, the elevation maps. In the I images in this slide, I'm showing um, pictures of people touching the materials in, in the corner. I show a field print where it made spaghetti all over the printer, and of course we couldn't use it. Anyway, so testing, testing, testing. So then we decided we were going to use additional astronomical objects and star clusters. Our main object was Westerland 2, which we were doing a study on, very different than NGC 602. And I'm showing a picture of Westerland 2 here. It's a double cluster. It has lots of gas and dust, very rich field. So we did NGC 602, Westerland 2, and then another one. But then we had a galaxy study. Galaxies are made of what? Gas, dust, filamentary structure, and star clusters. So we already had our template made, so we translated those templates to galaxies, delineated the features in galaxies, and we started with spiral galaxies because A, they're really beautiful, and B, the star cluster is very clear that we can uh, see them very, and people were working on making catalogs of the clusters. So we had all of this rich data that we could assign the textures to. Eventually we did solar system objects and exoplanets applying textures to those. And now I'm working on um, multi-wavelength prints of James Webb Space Telescope and Chandra Space Telescope um, objects as well for the ones that we've done. So, what, so the great thing is that it was very easy and we found this in testing that if, someone understood the template for the star clusters because they can't contain stars, gas, and filaments. We can translate to a, a galaxy. The only thing is the scale is vastly different. And here I'm showing Westerland 2 on the left and then lines that point to, to give you a sense of scale. It's not really, I mean, Westerland 2 is in a nearby galaxy, but not the one I'm showing. But the idea is that the scale is different, but the material is the same. So, once people got that, it, it was pretty amazing. People, e even who didn't know a lot about astronomy, we found in our very preliminary tests, people were getting the textures translated from the star cluster galaxy. And then it's like, oh, all right, I'm sort of getting what galaxies are and universe and things like that. It's, it, it's a lot to absorb in 10 minutes, but um, we noticed that people were getting it. So we, then we tested this all again. Right, we modified the textures. We took them to National uh, Federation of the Blind conferences again, Maryland School for the Blind, which Anna participated in, Air and Space, which Anna organized, trade shows, and we were testing to to verify the integrity of these uh, objects. That are they usable? They may be representative of the astronomy, but if people can't use it, they don't understand it. We have to go back to the drawing board, and happily people were getting it. They were really having a lot of fun. One thing we did notice is that almost uh, without exception, every uh, boy of high school um, age wanted to throw the spiral uh, galaxies across the room like a boomerang, but we managed to stop that. Um, anyway, what I'm showing is a whole bunch of pictures of people examining both texture maps and the full-fledged two-sided 3D models of galaxies and the star clusters. Um, there's a whole bunch of prints that are on my website, which I'm going to give at the end. Uh, this, this slide I'm showing now shows a bunch of objects, NGC 602 and Westerland 2, and their corresponding 3D print, a bunch of galaxies, um, a spiral galaxy called 1566, which we use actually as a training galaxy in our subsequent activities. 
the Whirlpool Galaxy, and a number of others. These are all available online. You can have all the models, print them to your heart's consent. At the bottom, I actually show some of the JWST data, HST and JWST of an object called NGC 7318. So we also did, besides conferences and trade shows, week-long summer camps early on um, it, it, as a suite of astronomical activities where the star clusters and the, the galaxies were part of that, just to test, do the, do the students understand it? How do they use them? Can, can they tell each other what this is about? Are they getting it? And uh, does this start to interest them in STEM at all? And so happily, this pilot testing, not only was a proof of contest, a, a concept for our, our materials, but it also showed that our methodology for using astronomy to inspire students in STEM using using astronomy for that. So we we were hosted by a couple of state bureaus graciously um, and a school for the blind in the beginning just to do the testings. And now we have a new program um, funded by NSF. The students actually build the printers. I probably have spoiled things for Tom, but anyway, we have a whole program now that's funded that uses these materials and many others uh, to bring astronomy and STEM and career paths to students. Um, I just had some pictures from the camps. Uh, a note about the software. There's a software called Astro 3D, which we primarily use for the galaxies. It does auto assignment of the textures. You can do some hand, you know, create regions or paint or whatever. You can erase stuff and then it creates the print file and then uh, the software is available for free on GitHub. Um, these prints take a long time. So we split, in order to make the prints at least eight and a half by 11, we have to split them in half and each half takes 15 hours. If it, if it messes up, it's, there are many tiers. Okay, uh, just in, so I have a summary, uh, slide. Um, it's available. The big points are we we have proven we can represent astronomy with 3D printing. We did lots and lots of testing. We did an analysis of the scientific integrity. We believe that th the 3D prints really, really do represent the, uh, at least in part, the astrophysics. They are quite usable. And um, pilot testing at the summer camp showed that the students were getting it and that they were understanding what we were talking about. And the last slide shows my contact information and uh, where the, the uh, whole discussion of our project references and where some of those prints are accessible. I also, because this is NASA funded, um, as well as NSF funded, the prints are available through the NASA 3D website. Um, Tom Madura, who is the speaker following, he and I, you have to look our names up in contributors because we're they're sort of NASA, but not. So you don't get to be on the main page, but you have to look up our names. And then, then our 3D prints are there. You can download them. Have a great time. Thank you so much, Carol. That was fantastic. I'll also go ahead and share that URL in the chat here. So if anyone wants to, to check that out, please feel free. And, uh, you know, Carol, I have right here uh, one of the boomerang galaxies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I do. I, yeah, I have, the, I have the pink one. <laughs> this oh, is one so of my weird. favorites. <laughs> <laughs> and that I know my background is interfering that I do have right right um, two. a couple of... and I do have a Hubble model now so anyway <laughs> that's amazing so Great. yeah so exciting to see to see how this work has grown and evolved and uh, we do have time for a couple questions here so if anyone has questions for Dr. Christian please go ahead and use the the Q&A feature uh, it looks like Rick asks if you have any thoughts on how this would apply to a blind person in space, um, whether they're studying this on a spaceship or a blind person going into space. So, say the, uh, I'm not getting the sense of the question. How can we apply this to a person who is blind going into space and or as they are studying this on the spaceship? 
Uh, so for example, maybe could this technology perhaps help a blind person if they're training to go to space? Maybe we could use absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that happened to me in the beginning was that when we were doing some testing at a conference, people came in and were looking at the prints and then they were like, well, why don't you have a 3D print of the hotel? Mm. And I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a great idea. So uh, actually, I think um, 3D printing of um, of tools and things they might encounter, it might be an affordable way of preparing someone. Uh, so you don't have to build a whole expensive facility. You might be able to do prototype 3D prints of objects that will be encountered. Um, so I think there is that. But the other thing I will say about space is that you, you probably all know that there's makerspace and other companies are now, you know, there are printers on board the space station and they can print tools and other stuff. And if they need something, you can upload the file and then they print it. They test it on the ground, then they upload the file. Astronaut needs a wrench. They've done that. So there are lots of applications that, um, would be helpful for everyone. And I'm sure the person who asked the question has all kinds of ideas, which would be great to hear. Sci Access. Learn more at www.sciaccess.org.